in the Lord's house with you, and it's good to pick up a study that we've been enjoying. I hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have. In the book of Genesis, we've had some other night studies and other things that have come along, up along the way, but now back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 41, if you'll turn there, you could entitle the message from prison to palace, from prison to palace, and if you will, we're going to see in this first verse that um, some two years later, uh, again, Joseph is still in the prison. And again, there of a wrongful accusation, uh, Joseph has only tried to do what is right, tried to do what is pleasing to God, yet he has found himself in prison and has been in there for some time, uh, even this, uh, for this later two years after the event uh, with the uh, two gentlemen from the household of Pharaoh. Uh, but if you will, let's uh, first go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll pick up in our text tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, we thank you for the salvation that you offer us freely through your Son. We thank you for the uh, will that you have for us. We don't have a better will than what you have for us. We pray that we would seek to understand your will, that we would seek to surrender to your will and to do your will. We pray that if there's anyone here tonight that's lost, that they would be saved before it's too late, but with all of us that we would come closer uh, to following you in, in obedience and surrender. But we love you. We thank you. Please use me as a vessel and help us to understand and apply your word. And it's in your son's precious name we do pray. Amen. If you will, again, uh, turning to Genesis 41, know this, that what we've already seen in the past few chapters, we've seen uh, God grow and use Joseph to face and overcome one temptation to sin. Uh, he faced it and he overcame it with victory and obedience to God. We've also seen him face trial and overcome trial with obedience to God. We Again, we've seen him uh, some 13 years um, that he is going to, after the after where we're picking up today, some 13 years um, he has been in slavery and also in prison in that time in the land of Egypt. Yet, listen, we don't find Joseph complaining. Again, a man who's tried to do nothing wrong but tried to do what pleases God, yet he has suffered wrongfully all these years, but you don't find Joseph complaining. You actually find him praising God and worshiping God and still serving God. Amen. What a testimony. Not only have you seen him face temptation to sin and also trial or hardship, but in this text, you're going to see him face and uh, be blessed with great blessing and abundance from God. And he's going to face that well, too. He's going to praise God and seek to honor God. And glorify God. What a great testimony. Amen. As we look to the text, there's much for us to greater get a glimpse of God and how we are to trust Him and to obey Him and uh, trust Him with everything. But also we're going to learn much from the life and the example of Joseph as a servant of God and what we can apply to our life as well. Pick up with me, if you will, Genesis 41 and verse 1. We'll read a section at a time and unfold what is being discussed. Verse 1, it says, And it came to pass at the end of the two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, a, a, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat shed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river, and the ill-favored and the lean-fleshed kind did eat the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. 
And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Pause there for just a moment. Again, if you will, um, Joseph would spend an additional two years in prison. And if you will, he helped, if you would recall in that time, for the butler and the baker, if you will, of, the, of Pharaoh that he had cast into prison. Again, J uh, Joseph was serving God in that time and overseeing inside the prison, but he had great care for the people who were under his care, and he paid attention to what bothered them, and he interpreted the dream of both of them. And listen, the dream of what he interpreted from God came to happen exactly how God said it would happen. Amen? But if you recall, um, Joseph made the request of the chief butler who he said was going to be released, and he was, but he asked him, would you remember me and have mercy on me? Would you plead my case, if you will, before the Pharaoh? Well, sadly, what happened as soon as the chief butler was released? No thought of Joseph entered his mind until in just a moment. Can you imagine that maybe just a a glimpse of hope of getting out of prison, of which we don't know how long he was already there. But now this time progresses, and now it's two full years after that. But again, listen, he's not complaining. He's still praising God. Amen? Again, but what's happened now at the conclusion of those two full years? Well, God sends Pharaoh a dream. And in this dream, if we, if we just read, and um, in this dream, uh, if you will, there's two dreams. And what he's going to tell them in a moment is that it's going to represent the same thing. But Pharaoh would dream two dreams of seven fat cattle arising uh, and feeding by the Nile. They'd come up out of the Nile and they're, they're fat, they're healthy, they're plump. And they feed by the Nile. But then what happened? Then after that, he sees seven thin cattle arise from the Nile and consume the fat cattle. Consume them. What an interesting dream. And then he, again, as we saw, Pharaoh awoke, but then he fell asleep and had another dream. And then that other dream was, again, he dreams of seven fat ears of corn arising on one stalk. That's a healthy stalk. And a rise in one stock that were then devoured by seven thin ears, right? So he has this dream, and again, he, he wakes up, and he's in this puzzling spot. But know this, before we move on to the next part, he's, he, he's going to try to get this figured out. But before we, we move on to that, you, you read of those two years there. Let me just go ahead and encourage you with this. Even though Joseph was forgotten and forsaken of man, he was not forgotten and forsaken of God. Amen? We're going to see that in just a moment. God's timing will be perfect. God's timing will be perfect, and what he was doing in the midst of it, again, was what only God can do. Verse 8, pick up with me, if you will. It says, And it came to pass in the morning, again after Pharaoh's dream, in the morning that his spirit was troubled. He was troubled within him. He'd received this dream. He would receive twice that were similar. He did not know the meaning of it, but he was troubled by it. And it said, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Can you imagine it? Him going out and going through all the resources and no one... And all of Egypt is able to tell him what his dream means. And he's still troubled. Then, verse 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults these, this day. He's actually about to go in to explain to him what happened in the prison when he was there with Joseph. He's going to tell him, I know someone that can help you with this problem. But let me tell you, it wasn't just a fault. He, again, he, he, he went back on the word uh, with Joseph and didn't return to him this, this grace and mercy that Joseph showed him. So again, it wasn't just a fault. That's what we're tempted to think about at times as well. We want to, we want to downplay our sin and our failure to do what we're called to do. 
But again, regardless of that, he says, look, I do remember my faults this day. I remember what I did wrong. And then he goes into, in verse 10, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants. He's recalling this. And put me in, in, war, in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream, he did interpret. Get this, verse 13. And it came to pass as he interpreted it to us. So it was. Me he, um, me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Do you recall that that went down there some two years ago? But again, he, he's telling them that, look, I, this is my fault. I forgot about this. I was supposed to do something about it then, but I didn't. But anyways, he's saying, but here, let me tell you about this now. There was a man there that was able to Interpret dreams. The solution to the problem that you have now, I know a man, right? And let me tell you again, it, it came to pass exactly as it was interpreted. Amen? It was. So then, if you will, what happens? Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Pause there for just a moment. Some might ask this question. Well, why did Joseph have to stay in there that remainder of the two years? Why? You know, it's interesting. We do indeed need to trust God. I don't know all the, all the maybe whys, but I do know this, that God's timing's perfect, isn't it? It is. When we might would have desired to be out of a situation sooner, there's some times where God keeps us in a situation but he's there with us and he's growing us. Amen? He is. He's faithful to do that. And we need to trust him and serve him even in those situations. But know this as well. The text also would tell us throughout the scripture that it is through times of hardship. What does God do with us? He grows us in patient endurance, doesn't he? He does. And he grows us in many other areas. He develops our character. He develops our hope in Him. Amen? I'm just going to tell you, Joseph's about to approach some hardships that the whole world's about to face, and he's going to need all of that. Amen? He's going to need patient endurance. He's going to need proven character. He's going to need um, hope in God. Amen? So again, I believe God was faithful to do that as well. But you know what's also interesting? I believe in those two years, God tested him as well. What God wants his children to do, whether it's in the prison or whether it's in the palace, God wants his servants to be found faithful. Amen? He does. And you know what the text says when he does find those that he has entrusted with a few things and they've been faithful, he makes them ruler over many. Amen? I believe that was what God was doing. He trusted him, entrusted him with service in the prison and he was found faithful and God made him a ruler over many things. Amen? Sometimes we're tempted as man, we, we do want to exalt ourselves at times. But God says those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves, they will be exalted. Amen? We ind indeed, we need to be faithful wherever we're at. Whatever circumstance we're going through, we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful, and again, we do indeed need to serve God and be faithful to Him. If you will, let's pick up. He, he's received Him. He went to send for Joseph, uh, but that's my last point in that on why the two years. Joseph is exactly where Pharaoh can find him. Amen? It's possible that if he, if he was released two years prior, that Joseph might have packed up and left and not even been in Egypt anymore. But again, God has Joseph exactly where Pharaoh can find him. Amen? 
And God's going to use this for, for something even greater and more important. So he sends for him. He gets shaved. He gets cleaned up. He puts on raiment. And it says, And came in unto Pharaoh, verse 15, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. I have heard, uh, I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. So again, he tells him, I've had a dream, no one else can interpret it, but I've heard that you can. And 16, it says, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Something very, very important that Joseph is found doing here. Joseph was not being proud. Joseph was not taking the opportunity to promote self. God, uh, excuse me, Joseph was not uh, boasting in himself. Joseph actually was humble and he put the focus on who? God. Amen? He says again, it is not me, it is God. Amen? With you and I today, it doesn't matter what God might use you and I for whether it be in the church, whether it be in our home, whether it be in your workplace or in the community or in anything, whatever God uses you to do and it's good and it's worthwhile, we must do the same that Joseph did. Don't put focus on me, right? It's not me. If it's anything good, it's God. Amen? It is. Again, in ministry, in life, and in personal ministry, we don't need to claim credit. Amen? We don't need to promote self. We don't need people that will follow us, a mere man. We need to put the focus on God. Amen? He is the answer. He is the solution. He is everything. Again, I love that. That's exactly what Joseph is doing. Uh, but again, then it goes on in verse 17. It says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph in my dream, and we won't repeat it. He's just going to repeat the dream that we just read, he's going to relay the dream to him, and he'll end with, and no one was able to declare it to me. Um, but then it goes into verse 25. Pick up with me in 25, if you will. So Joseph hears out the dream, and it says, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what is about, excuse me, what he is about to do. So again, know that um, Joseph hears the dream, but he tells him, listen, you've had two dreams, but listen, it's one. It means one thing. They both mean the same thing. And then again, he says, and God is doing this. God is showing you, Pharaoh. He is showing you what he is about to do. And that's exactly what, it, what is happening. It's, again, it's not just nature having its, its, its just uncontrolled course of action, no, it's God that's doing it. Amen? There may be times where nature will take its course. But again, you must know that God is always in control. Uh, it makes me even think of this uh, uh, verse of Scripture too. Let me, let me even read this uh, for you. Psalm 105, 16 through 22 Know this, this is what God's doing. It is God that's doing this. Verse 16 says, Moreover, he called, in this psalm, he's talking about what happened here with Joseph. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. God did that. Amen? God did that. Again, there's times where God brings famine to get people's attention that are in sin. Maybe a nation, maybe a whole, the whole globe has rejected God and has no desire for God. And God may send things to get their attention so that they would turn to him of whom they truly need. Amen? There also may be in this time where God is going to use this to get his chosen people uh, in, in a place where he wants them. But again, it says this, verse 16, it says, Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He brake the whole staff of bread, and he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. 
He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him what we're about to pick up in our story in Genesis in a minute. He says he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. Amen. We just need to know this is that God is the one behind it all. He is the one who's sovereign. He is the one who's in control. Amen. And he has a purpose in all of it. Let me also read Proverbs 21 and 1. It says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Amen? God was turning Pharaoh's heart exactly where he wanted. He was turning him to a specific person for a specific reason. Amen? And we need to trust that today too. Amen? God doesn't change. He doesn't change. We need to trust today, even when things are chaotic, where the world is going evil and more evil, we need to trust that God is still in control. Amen? That will give you comfort. That will give you hope. We need to know today as well that God is able to do the same thing in the king's heart as well. Turn it wherever he wants it to go. Amen? For his high purposes. If you will... Let's pick back up in in the text that we just left off with. Uh, But he's telling him, look, God is is telling you exactly what he's about to do. Verse 26 of Genesis 41. The seven good kind are seven years. And the seven good years are seven years. The dream is one. And the seventh in and the ill-favored kind that came up after the seven years and the the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be be known in the land by reason of that famine following. Forget this, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Again, Joseph gives interpretation of the dream. Look, all of this in your dream, they represent the same thing, and it it was given twice. Why? To show that God's established it. It's going to happen. It will happen. And that it will also come about quickly, shortly, it's happening now. It's in the process. But again, he, he told him that what this meant is, again, seven years of abundance is coming to Egypt. Seven years of abundance is coming, but what's coming after that is seven years of grievous famine, okay? Grievous famine. And again, I, I love this. He's telling him what happened, but uh, telling him what's going to happen. And then in 33, listen to all of this, if you will. And starting in verse 33, he then gives him godly wisdom. He gives him advice on what to do with what he knows is going to happen. He says this, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt, Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part. Again, so 20% of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the foods of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let him keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt. 
that the land perish not through the famine. Amen? He's given him wisdom. Again, he tells him, look, you need to find one person to oversee the plan of what you need to do. You need to get someone who's discreet, someone who is wise, and you need to set him over all the land of Egypt. Then you need to select again other officers who will, who will be in part of what they're doing is this. In those seven years of plenty and extra, he's, he's saying, don't do this. Don't go spend it. Save it, right? And he's telling them, you all, you get them and you gather 20% of it. And all of us, we need to listen. There's much to learn here. In those years of plenty, you save for the years of not plenty of famine. And he even tells him, I love the detail in this description. He says for the, to, to do that and to gather it up, to even store it in the cities that you're gathering it up, it's going to be the same cities that's going to be there ready to disperse later. But he says, gather it up. It's going to be under your control, under your watch. But then when famine comes, the land will be prepared and they won't perish. Amen. One, he gave him wise counsel. You know what's coming. Here's the wise thing to do to be ready. Amen. Here's what we do need to know today. There's much wisdom for us to take from that. Amen. I'll tell you, it's what we often are prone to do first of all is to never do what God says to do in, in wisdom. What we are prone to do by nature and what the flesh wants is we would not want to save, right? But here's the truth. Uh, there will come times where we will need and it won't be as prosperous and abundance, abundant as it, as it is now, right? There will be times where that will come. We're living in an age, again, that is driven and controlled by pleasure and appetite. We're living in a land of abundance, and sometimes we foolishly think that that's just going to last forever, right? We're living in a time that throughout Scripture it says to be wise, it says to prepare for the future, but in our age, it's too, too often what happens is uh, we buy stuff we don't need, with money that we don't even have. That is far the extreme of what God is calling us to be wise with finances. Amen. So again, let all of us listen. God wants us to be wise. He wants us to work hard. He wants us then to be financially wise. He doesn't want us to live for pleasure. If we live for pleasure, before we know it, we're going to be poor. Amen. All the money is going to be gone. But if we work hard, we're diligent, and we're wise, and we save for the future, you're going to be prepared when hardship comes. Amen? Now listen, God wants us to be wise like that. He does. Again, He wants us to be able to work, to provide for our own family, to provide for ourselves. And then when it comes a time where hardships come, you're, you're able to do that. Then even work for yourself, provide for yourself, but then also, he wants us to get where, when we're blessed and have that, when someone is in true, deed, true need indeed, again, there's a lot of things that aren't needs, but when there's someone in true need, you're able to make that decision to help them as well. This is all wisdom that God wants to give us in the text. Again, much wisdom. Joseph was definitely a wise man. Joseph was definitely what we're going to see. He's the man for the job. Again, he, he gives this idea to them. This is what needs to be done. So again, we can take wisdom and saving here. There's definitely that lesson to learn. But there's also this lesson to learn as well. Proverbs 29 and 2. Proverbs 29 and 2 says this. When the righteous are in, in authority, the people do what? They rejoice. When the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Okay? What we're about to see happen is Pharaoh's going to be smart enough to do this. I see a man right there with godly wisdom. He's in charge. Amen? He's going to put him in charge. And listen, they're going to be able to fare throughout the famine. And they're, they're going to be able to feed the whole region, the whole world. Okay? But listen, it only happened, why? 
One, because God is, is at work in all of this. But also they were wise enough to put a godly man with godly wisdom and leadership. Amen? We've seen it in our life. You go through different leaders that our country has, maybe even that our state has had, our, our, our local leaders. Listen, when it's a godly person that wants to enact godly wisdom and be wise, let me tell you, the people rejoice, don't they? But when it is an ungodly person that rejects the wisdom of God and just wants to do it their way and in ways that don't make even sense. You see that the people, they mourn. It's hardship. It's not helping the people, it's hurting the people. May we be people that would do this, do what's about to have happen with Joseph. May we be people that want godly, wise people in leadership everywhere. Amen? May we want that. May we also want to be that. May we want to be wise and godly leaders as well. Verse 37, it picks up and it says, And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Okay? So Joseph spoke what was going to happen. He says, and here's the wise plan to do because of what's, what's going to happen. And then it says all of them, they, they, they thought, wow, this is a, this is a great plan. We, we approve of this plan. This is good. This is wise. In 38, it says, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, every, all the other people that were um, in, in areas of office around him, he said unto all of them, it says, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? He asked the question, Can we find another man like this man, that the Spirit of God is at work in him? And again, that is, that is uh, what is the, the situation with Joseph and, again, and, and, and leaders that we have in our lives everywhere. It needs to be spirit-filled men who will teach and practice the Word of God. Again, in church, in home, uh, in other leadership areas in the church as well. We, we need spirit-led men who will teach the Word and that will do the Word, not just do our own thing. Again, in, in, in areas of leadership in, in, in business, in areas of leadership in local government, state government, um, uh, the glow, uh, excuse me, even in the country as well, we do indeed need people who are godly people and with godly wisdom. It said in 39, it said, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. According unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Listen. He has this wise plan. Again, God made known to him even the interpretation of what's even going to happen. And again, Pharaoh wisely said, look, you're the man for the job. You're it. You're the one that's wise you're the one that clearly God is, is, is at work in giving this wisdom. You're going to be the leader. And then he goes in to listen to the laundry list of blessing and promotion. Again, we need to seek God and trust God. And, and this is exactly what he did. And this is exactly what God calls to happen specifically with Joseph. He says, look, even just me, Pharaoh said, I'm the only one that's going to be higher in, in, in power and authority in all of Egypt. He says, you're going to be second in command. And he says, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, see, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt, making him in authority of all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. Again, this uh, great uh, symbol of authority and able to stamp and approve and get things done. He said, look, I, I give this ring uh, from my hand and put it upon Joseph's hand. And he arrayed him in vestures of fine linen. He put fine linen upon him and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. Again, that fine, great chariot that was second only to his um, that was for the second in command, he gives this to Joseph to be transported around in. 
And he said, and in, think about that while he's in the chariot, it says this, and they cried before him, um, and it says, cried before him, bow the knee, um, he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Again, everywhere that Joseph was going to go, everyone would bow down in, in, in respect and in submitting to his authority. And it said, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Again, he says this, look, I'm Pharaoh. However, listen, with you, no one is even going to be able to act in, in Egypt without your approval. Can you imagine this authority that he's been exalted to? Then it even says in Pharaoh, uh, excuse me, in Pharaoh 45, and Pharaoh called Joseph's, Joseph's name zephnath paneah and, and he gave him uh, to wife um, Asenath, um, the daughter of Potiphar, Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Can you imagine this great blessing that Pharaoh's given him? He's even, some of the things we already went through, but another thing, he gave him a new name. This, this, this new name, zaphnath Panea, actually means the one who furnishes the substance of the land. Again, the great honor that he, he is being bestowed. He also would give him a, a wife um, as well. And then it said, though, that pretty much Joseph went right out to examine everything and get started. Again, he's, he's diligent. He knows how important that what he has been given is, and he gets right to it. What does 46, and, and it's interesting to note there, he got right to it, didn't he? We mentioned earlier that he didn't take this newfound promotion and blessing and authority. He didn't take it and be lifted up in pride with it, did he? No. One, he's honoring God, but he's also there to serve and to help, right? Do you notice that he doesn't just immediately make it about himself? We've already seen that. But he also doesn't sit back and, and make it all about him. He also, did you see anywhere in there that he went back to the ones that wronged him and wanted to get even? No, he didn't. He didn't take that as an occasion to, to get even. No, he is there to serve God. He is there to love and serve and help people. So again, 46, pick up with me if you would. It says, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. Again, what God prophesied would happen, it would just bear in abundance, be great abundance throughout the land for these full seven years. And they brought it in by the handfuls. And 48, it says, And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea. He is gathering them up as innumerable as, as the sand of the sea. It said very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. He, he finally got to the point where it was so much that was gathered, he stopped counting and keeping record there was so much. It was beyond even counting. But again, great things that God is using him for and putting in there to... Can you imagine, though, he's 30 now. That would uh, be about some 13 years he went through slavery and he went through prison. But because he has been humbled, because he is humbling himself, and because he's serving God, God's exalting him to this area of, of leadership. And now God is using him in even more of a great way. He's going to be able to save millions of people. Amen? We're going to even see later God's going to bring his own people there to be safely kept and to reunite there with Joseph. And to do it, actually, as, as God already said in another dream would happen, his family would bow down before him. And that's exactly what will happen. Verse 50, though, if you will, it says, And unto Joseph were born two sons. 
But can you see it? All this was gathered up. All this was prepared. All this great abundance even gathered up as extra, saving for the future. But then 50, it says, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. So again, before those years of famine came, he's blessed with two sons. Which Asnath, uh, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And it's interesting, he, he's, not, he's not thinking, well, there's famine coming. Is this really the smart or right time for me to have kids? No. He's trusting God with everything that's going to happen. Amen. He is being wise with saving. He is being wise with preparing. And listen, he's simply blessed with kids and he has kids. He has these kids, and uh, 55, 51, it says, And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me um, forget all my to toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he um, Ephraim, uh, or Ephraim, and it said, For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Again, Manasseh, which literally means made to forget. And again, he, he's naming him, these children this way. But notice this. Even though he's been promoted, he's in great success in, in, this, in Egypt. He is second in command uh, in all of Egypt. Even despite that, listen, he's still glorifying God, isn't he? He's still praising God. He didn't go off and say... I'm going to name my kids after something that glorifies me. No, he's glorifying God. And this is what he glorifies God for. One, God caused him to forget um, all the hardships and being treated poorly um, back at his father's house. When he was mistreated by his family and, and hated and sold into slavery by his family, God allowed him to forget that. I believe God trusted him for that. Amen. Listen, Joseph could have went the route of, of being bitter. He could have let that um, seed of bitterness grow and fester and spread. It could have spread more and consumed his whole life. It could have consumed everyone around him, but he would have been quite the different man. But he didn't choose to let bitterness um, consume. No, he chose to give it to God and trust God. He chose to forgive, amen? And now he is praising God for what God did with that. It also says in Ephraim, which means fruitful. We even see that he said, for God calls me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Again, right? This, this land that he's in that's not his own. He's a foreign there. He was sold into slavery there. He was wrongfully charged there. He was in prison there. Again, in this land of his affliction, yet God caused him to prosper in it. Amen? My friend, that's exactly what God desires. No, no matter the hardship that you and I face, God still wants our best. Again, well, is, does he, is he just promising um, prosperity as a prosperity gospel that I'm going to put these rings on you like I did with him this this gold chain like he did with him and give you the finest, second finest chariot in all the land? No, he's not saying this. But God wants you to be prosperous and find good success, amen? And the greatest success we can find is spiritually, amen? The greatest success we can find is being more like Jesus. And what's interesting is Joseph's looking a lot like Jesus, amen? He is being more like Jesus like the Lord, and he is being grown in wisdom and being grown in godliness. But again, God's taking care of all the rest and, and blessing him in this prosperity as well. It then goes on, but I love that. He gives glory to God yet again. 53, it says, And, and the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Prosperity, they were able to save. They were able to save so much they stopped counting but again, it ended. But it ended exactly how God said it would end. And it said, In the seven years of dearth, or this famine, began to come according, to, according as Joseph had said. Exactly how Joseph had said, but exactly how God 
revealed it would happen. And the dearth was in all the land, but in all the land of Egypt there was what? There was bread. So again, this famine was spread throughout all the lands. It was covering the whole globe. But in Egypt, it says there was bread. Why? Because God saw to it and brought godly wisdom and they prepared. And God provided and there was bread. It said in 55, it said, And when all the land of Egypt was famished, they finally got to a point where with their own individual reserve, they ran out. But then what happened, again, the, each of the Egyptians did, but then what happened, it said, and the Pharaoh cried, excuse me, and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said unto the Egyptians, go unto Joseph, what he saith to you do. Right? Again, God set it up. God, God prepared. And now there's abundance, and Joseph is distributing it. Amen? He is and said unto all the Egyptians, um, and he told them, go to Joseph, whatever he tells you to do, do. Whatever he tells you to pay, pay it. And it, said, and it said, and the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in all the land of Egypt, and all countries, all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that famine was so sore in all the lands. Again, we can't miss this. God was at work. Amen. God was at work behind all of it. God is at work today too. Amen. What we must do is we must be wise. To be spirit led is to be scripture led. Amen. The Spirit of God will lead you unto all truth. We need to be people, again, whether it's in time of abundance or whether it's in time of famine, we need to let God lead us in His wisdom. Amen? That way we can do what He's calling us to do now and that when times get hard, we can as well. I'll tell you, it's too easy sometimes to, to slip into doing what comes natural to our flesh. It's too easy at times maybe to be controlled by our desires and what the flesh might want. It, we do want abundance at times. We do want pleasure at times. But listen, as God's people, would we deny that and say, I want what the Spirit of God wants, amen? I want what the Lord wants. Again, may we be a people that would be set apart even in that. We don't need to be like the world in that. About not being wise with work, not being wise with finance, not being wise with trusting God either. But again, he is calling us to indeed be wise. He does want to take care of us. And many times we just need to listen to him and obey him. And that is one of the greatest ways that he takes care of us and indeed leads us. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Let's conclude service if you'd end our live feed with prayer.